Japan is full of history, both factual and mythological, and we want to share these stories with you. I will be jumping around the history of Japan to find stories both interesting and fantastical. I'm your host, Thomas. And I'm your co host, Heather. We've both lived in Japan now for over two years and have learned so many interesting tales to tell. We'll also be reading a Japanese song or poem for you in Japanese, and we'll discuss the poet and meaning behind these songs. And with that out the way, Heather, you ready? I'm ready. Okay, let's go. Archives. I'm your co-host Heather, who is switching places with with me. So today Heather's going to tell me a story, and I will be doing a poem instead. Yes, I am really excited because Thomas knows way more, way, way, way more about Japanese history than I do, and to have something that I know about that I can share is so exciting. And I know this story because I was an ALT. And not last year, but the year before last, this story was in one of the books for the sixth grade. So I am so excited to share this story with you. I really liked this, this lesson and I enjoyed teaching it, which I am one of the very few apparently who thought it was fun.、Um, so I don't know how that happened, but I enjoyed it. So I, I'm glad to be sharing this with you because Momotaro,、um, which is the story I'm telling today, it has been told to Japanese children since they're probably. You know, still infants. This story is really popular for several, several years. Many iterations have been told of this story during, you know, elementary time,、uh, preschool time, and when they're just learning to read. So they are we're already familiar with the story, and to read it in English, it's, it's really exciting to be able to read a book in another language. Okay, I think I'll probably just listen. If I have any questions, I'll save them to the end. Okay, so today's story is Momotaro or the Peach Boy. Mukashi Mukashi, there lived an old couple. This couple was very happy, but they never had a child. They spent their days together on their farm happily doing chores. Now, the older woman liked to wash her clothes by the same place at the river every day. She was Very proud of how clean her laundry was, and she worked very hard to make it pika pika or sparkling clean. Well, on this particular day, she was getting ready to take her laundry home when, bobbing along the river, there was a huge and delicious looking peach. Oh, I must get that peach! It will be a wonderful treat for my husband and I to share. So she reached down, grabbed the peach from the water, put it in the basket with all her clothes, and headed home. Well, her husband was tending the fields close to home, so when she arrived, she said, Anata, come! Let's share this peach I found by the river! Eh? he said. He was a little hard of hearing, but he came all the same. The old woman takes the peach into the kitchen, grabs her knife, but before she can cut the peach, it splits in two, and out pops a baby boy. The couple, shocked, but very happy, Decides to name him Momotaro since he was born from the Momo or peach. Taro is a common name for Japanese boys, so literally his name means peach boy. Momotaro grew big and strong and brave. He always helped his family and those who were in need around the village. One day, when Momotaro was older, he happened to hear about the Oni or ogres from Onigashima Island harassing and stealing from a neighboring village. Mother, father, I must go. I must go and help drive away the Oni. It's too dangerous, his parents said. I know, but I must go. His mother, seeing her son was very determined to go, decided she would make him some food for his journey. She poured all her love and hopes and wished for Momotaro to complete his quest into the kibidango that she made. Here, take these kibidango. I hope they will give you power and strength. Gambarimas, his father said. Or good luck. Well, Momotaro heaved his bag filled with kibidango on his back and set out. Well, he hadn't gone too far when he saw a dog. Greetings! Where are you going? And what's in your bag? It smells so delicious. He sniffed the air and panted. I'm going to Onigashima to defeat the Oni. I'll give you a kibidango if you wish to come with me. Yes, I will, 
So Momotaro gave his new friend a kibi dango, and two friends set out. A short time later, they heard a noise in the trees above them, and down swung a monkey. Hello, hello! Where are you two going? And hey, what's in that bag? We're going to Onagashima! We're going to defeat the Oni! It's Kibi Dango. If you come with us, I'll give you one. Ah, yes, I will! Kibi Dango, if you please. So Momotaro gave his new friend a Kibi Dango, and the three friends set out. They were getting close to Onagashima Island when they heard a ruffle in the nearby grass. Out popped a Kiji. A Kiji is a type of pheasant. Ooh, ooh, what's that you have in your bag? And where are you off to? We're going to Onagashima to defeat the Oni. It's Kibi Dango. If you come with us, I'll give you one. Okay, I will. So Momotaro gave his new friend a Kibi Dango, and the four friends set out. At last, they reached the shores across from Onagashima. They boarded a boat. On the way, they ate their Kibi Dango. When they at last reached the misty shore, they spied an Oni. Oi! What are you doing here? He cried. We've come to stop you from terrorizing the village. Ha! You weak. Boy, dog, monkey, Kiji, do you know how many of us there are? And like magic, many, many Oni popped up surrounding Momotaro and his friends. We'll fight you, they shouted, and they began to fight. Well, what the Oni didn't know is that the Kibi Dango, lovingly made by Momotaro's mother, had given the four friends the strength of over a thousand people. They easily defeated the Oni. Ouch, ouch, we're sorry. We'll leave the village alone, I swear. Please, just take the things from the village and leave. We won't bother anyone ever again. And with that, tears filled the Oni's eyes. Momotaro and his friends, victorious, took all the stolen goods from the ogres and returned them to the village. Well, when Momotaro returned home, his new friends came along too. They lived happily together with Momotaro and his parents for many happy years. Bloody. Hmm, it's a fairy tale that I didn't know. Hmm. The only thing I thought about when you were saying it was the fact that Momotaro was brought up by an old couple. Which, when you think back to like last episode when we talked about Fuji,、hmm. so we had the Princess Glory and we had the we mentioned the tale of the bamboo cutter. In that one as well, the mystical character that appears is raised by an old couple. So I'm just trying to think: is that like a normal trope for Japanese fairy tales? Like normally, it's an old couple. Instead of like a young couple. Oh, Thomas! Oh, I'm so excited! You you're transitioning just lovingly. This is beautiful. Did I ask the right question? <laughs> you asked the perfect question because I have some Momotaro facts. I found、okay. one of these facts out recently. As you know, if you've read my blog, I really love Chiko Chan, and they shared this fact. This story that I told you today is the one that's commonly told now, and it's been told for several years. I don't have the exact estimate, but the original story of Momotaro is a little bit different. The old woman finds the peach, but instead of a baby boy popping out, she eats it and turns into a young and beautiful woman. She then runs to her husband because. Now she's young and beautiful. She's like, you've got to eat this peach. You've got to try it. Well, he turns young and beautiful as well. When two people who are young and attractive love each other very much, things happen. And nine months later comes Momotaro. Now it's been changed. It's been changed because it's a little bit more, you know, stork friendly to say that he came from a peach as opposed to the. Natural biological process of childbirth.、So、I, when I found that out, I was really surprised. It's a possible origin story. And speaking of origins, now I live close to Okayama Prefecture. And do you know what Okayama Prefecture is famous for? I'm gonna guess that it's famous for peaches. Ping pong, you are correct. It is the Peach Prefecture. It's said that the story of Momotaro possibly originates from Okayama because Okayama is famous for peaches, and there's also Momotaro Museum. There is around Okayama Station. There's lots of、uh, Momotaro statues. I think Kurashiki is where the Momotaro Momotaro Museum is. So the fairy tale originated in this prefecture. Well, possibly, because guess what? Other places also claim the、uh, Momotaro story as well. There's even a Momotaro shrine in Aichi Prefecture. It's filled with rather unusual statues. They don't censor Momotaro's moment of peach birth. And you can see him in all his post-peachy glory. It's a really interesting park, and there's, I think, even a 
like a peach tori gate. I would say general consensus is maybe Okoyama, but other places like claim as well. I think even in that shrine in Naichi even has a sign that says, this is the true place of Momotaro. Another thing, oni are Japanese ogres. There are good oni, bad oni, and all shades of in between. I know that there's a, a, a few different oni, and I'm not going to do so much because I know there are so many stories that involve Oni. The ones in Momotaro's story are more of the naughty kind who don't, to my knowledge, don't actually hurt anyone, just kind of steal things or dorobo. So uh, I think just scare the heck out of people as opposed to, you know, really terrible stuff. So do you have any other questions? Uh, for this fairy tale, I don't think so. I thought for sure you were going to ask me what Kibidango were. So Kibidango is... Well, you know, tell me, please tell me what dango are. Well, dango is, it's related to mo, you know, like the pounded rice, but it's basically like a Japanese dumpling slash sweet. They're really chewy. They're kind of flavorless. So it's based on more like whatever you coat them in or dip them in. Mm. Obvious dango are made from rice flour and sugar and starch and all that fun stuff. The kibi dango apparently hails from kibi province. It's made, it's a reference to Kibi no Kuni, which is roughly around the area of Okayama Prefecture. It was made from possibly kibi or like millet flour as well as the rice flour together. So it was a specific type of dango that was mixed with millet flour. Well, the modern kibi dango don't use the millet, uh, just uses the mochi flour, but the origins of it did have a mixture. I don't know if it had any flavor with it as well. Uh, I assume probably it was just like similar to dango where it didn't have like the filling, like the mochi, um, mochi cakes have the an usually inside, sometimes like the black sesame paste. I think these were possibly just the like the dumplings themselves. But no, thank you for the fairy tale. It was interesting. It was, one, yeah, one I wasn't that familiar with. I knew of Momotaro, but I didn't actually know. Thank you very much. You are so welcome. And now I have said my story. I am eagerly awaiting your poem. So the poet that I chose today is another one of the Fujiwara clan. They seem to be quite prolific in this time period for being poets. So it makes sense that we have another one already. This chap went by the name Fujiwara no Teika. He was born in 1162 and died in 1241. So he lived, so he was born in the Heian period, but died in the Kamakura period. So he ah. lived in two different periods of Japanese history. And he lived during the reign of Emperor Go Toba. We actually know quite a lot about him as he wrote a diary called the Meigetsuki, um, which was like his own musings, his own thoughts, as well as like a diary of his life. And we know, we know a lot about him from that. We know a lot about his childhood, his exploits in the political system, his interactions with the emperor. And we actually know that throughout his life, he was quite an ill man. Like he was constantly sick. He didn't have a good composition. So yeah, he got sick quite a lot. So it was quite interesting that he actually managed to live until about 80 years old, which by Japan standards, I was reading that in that day, 40 years old was the equivalent of being an old man. So he ah. doubled that. So like I've said, he was of the Fujiwara. So he was part of the Fujiwara clan, but these big houses at the time, they had many offshoot clans or like branch clans as they were called. So he was part of a branch called the Mikohidari clan, which were best known for their poetic pursuits. So most Fujiwaras who were part of this, they were known to be really good poets at the time. And throughout his life, he's participated in lots of different poetry competitions, especially ones called the Hyakushu, which was basically a competition in where every poet who took part would be given a certain theme, so like spring or like cherry blossoms or love. And it was their job to write 100 poems on that theme and submit it to see if they would win the competition. And further on in his life, he then himself started to judge different poetry competitions in which, again, there would be a theme and they would be done in what was called rounds. So like 100 rounds or 600 rounds. I think the biggest poetry competition they ever had was 1500 rounds, which lasted quite a long time. And basically the rules for that were while he was judging, they would put two different poems side by side by two different poets of the same theme and they would be judged and either 
One would be the winner, one would be the loser, or it would end in a tie. And then the next round of poems would begin. So yeah, that was a little background about Teika. He has a lot of poems. He made his own personal book on his poetry oh. and wrote some of his favourites in it. But there's the belief that he wrote so many poems, even in his own personal collection of poetry, there was probably only 8% of his total poems that he wrote in his entire career. So yeah, he was a very good poet. And when he wasn't writing poems, he would do other pursuits, like he would write out copies of old books, um, especially the Lotus Sutra, he liked to make copies of that, and he would give them as gifts to people to help raise his status and things like that. So the poem I picked today is one specific poem which he wrote for the emperor, well, by this point, the retired emperor, Go Toba. So a little backstory, a little history behind the reasoning for this poem. So Teika had been suffering at this point for many years in mourning for his mother who had died in 1193. And the poem I've chosen relates to the 20th anniversary of his mother's death. So he was called to recite poems to the retired emperor, Go Toba. And he sent him a letter saying to him basically that he didn't want to do it. It was the 27th anniversary of his mother's death and he wanted to pay her respects. However, the retired emperor tells him he has to commit regardless. And basically this is the poem he wrote in retaliation. Ah, I'm very intrigued. So the Japanese would be as follows. Sayaka ni mo mirubeki yama wa kasumitsutsu. Wagami no hokamo, haru no yo no suki. And the English translation for that would be The mountains that I should be able to see clearly have misted over. This spring night's moon belongs to someone else. Oh. Mm. And that is actually one of two poems he wrote that evening for the emperor, which were written in anger. Um, if you want, I can read you the other one. I'll take two poems, please. Okay. So the second one would go as follows. Michi no be no, no hara no yanagi, shita mo inu, aware nageki no, keburi kurabe ni. And the English for that one would be, a willow in a meadow by the side of the road has secretly bloomed, vying against the smoke of my smoldering lament. Hmm. Now, Teika did write these in keeping with the theme for the poetry recitals of that evening, but obviously the emperor understood the hidden meanings in these poems and actually sent him away in anger because of these. And there's obviously the theories that when you look into the, the meanings of it, so the first one where he's saying, like it hints that on the surface, it could relate to like the heartlessness of someone who is beloved, but at a deeper level, it is like Taker saying that he is bereft, that he wasn't allowed to lament for his mother that yeah. day and was made to go and recite these poems for the emperor. And similarly, the second one where it's talking about vying against the smoke of my smoldering lament. So basically you could interpret that as him saying something like, the emperor is angry because I declined to come to his party, but I'm also angry because he's belittling the affection that I still hold to my mother and he has forced me to be here. Clearly I have the greater cause for resentment in this situation. So you can see these nuances if you analyze the words a little more in depth. And basically because of these two poems, even though they were in keeping with the theme of the night, he wrote them in such a way that he not only let the emperor know of his anger and resentment of being here, but he actually wrote it in a way that he knew the emperor would understand. And then subsequently due to this, the emperor had him sent away in anger. I was wondering how the emperor's reaction would be. He was just sent away in anger and not imprisoned or killed because I, I was a little worried about him. So basically, yeah, he was only sent away from the emperor's anger and it's highly likely that after that day he never saw the retired emperor again and Taker was no longer allowed to attend palace events. So he actually, although he could no longer go to the palace and take part in like poetic events or any matter events in actuality, he actually got quite lucky, like he could have been sent into exile, he could have been stripped of his power, he could have been stripped of his family name, mm -hmm. but he actually was quite fortunate in this regard and he was just told to never come here again. Yeah, the really interesting thing I'm, I'm finding, the more I study Japanese literature and 
Japanese language is that there are so many things that are not literal, that there are deeper meanings and hidden meanings that you don't say specifically, but there is implied meaning. And if you said he wrote the poem in such a way that the emperor knew he was angry, but he could have still written the poem in such a way that he was still angry, but it was even more hidden, but he purposely made it so that the emperor would understand that、uh, maybe the other people at the contest may not have understood, or they may have understood. There could have been like an audible gasp of, <gasps> I'm not sure if there was the reaction of <laughs> Japanese people during this time period if something really, something negative against the emperor happened by a, another person in court, if there was an audible. Response or like no response and just dead silence. I'm wondering how many of the people there understood what was going on. I have a feeling if the emperor understood, I feel like everyone there probably got the information as well. Yeah, I think everyone there, there were other people that sort of would have understood what was happening. Yeah, words have power sometimes. <laughs> They definitely do, and I think, especially the more we read into the poetry in Japan, like they use poetry as a way of giving important messages. Like,、mm. there was even a time further back in Taker's history that there was a palace event which he wasn't invited to, so his adopted father, Shunze, wrote a poem basically asking for Taker to be allowed to go. He didn't write a letter, he wrote a poem, and that poem was powerful enough and moving enough to have them change their mind and realize. Lent and Taker could then participate.、Mm. So, poetry in old Japan definitely had a lot more power and weight behind it. I think, even with like separated lovers or people who wanted to become more intimate in many levels, would often send poems back and forth to communicate too. Or if they were trying to break up, also send a poem. Lovely poem that if you go back and look at it, it says basically, like, yeah, we're done. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh,、hmm. well, Thomas, that was, those were fantastic poems. I really enjoyed those, and I really enjoyed all the, the history as well. And that reminds me of my question, which ties back into the Momotaro story. You said that older people in Japan. Like、it was after 40 was considered older because most people they lived to about what 40, 50, and that it was very rare to get up to a more higher age bracket. Yeah, so that, that's also interesting for Momotaro. They're just in their 40s, they still got lots of energy potentially. Maybe the older people aren't as old as we would think of them today. Like, I was picturing like old couple, like people in their 90s, perhaps, um, like you know. Really, really old, but perhaps it was maybe people in the late 30s, early 40s. Yeah, that's a good point, actually. Like, they could be translating into English what would mean old age, but in the original Japanese, it was wrote at a time when old age was actually considered to be 40 years old. So, actually, we would imagine them as like almost retirement age, but in actuality,、hmm. like them, but they might actually be a lot younger than we think. It's just because of the time it was written and because of the way it's been translated, we get like a distorted. View. Well, Thomas, thank you so much for the poems and the history today. That's all right. And I am so glad to have shared Momotaro with you. And for those who are familiar with Momotaro, I hope that you found the new facts you may or may not know very interesting. And if you knew about them or you know more facts about Momotaro and the origin and even Kibidango, please share with us and let us know because we really love learning all sorts of. New and interesting facts and things that we haven't heard before. So please feel free to share. And that's going to do it for us today. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you next week. Yep. Thanks for listening, guys. Talk to you next week. Bye. If you enjoy the Japan archives and have an interest in Japanese history and mythology, please be sure to check out our growing database over at historyofjapan.co.uk. We continue to add more to it every week, and you can find the show notes for every episode up on the website too. It's a large undertaking, so please be patient while we try to make a database which all Japanese history lovers can find useful. You can find us over on Twitter at A History of Japan, and if you're on Instagram, you can find us there at Nexus underscore travels. That's N E X U S underscore travels. We also have a Facebook page, which you can find at Japan Archives. All of our social media is different. Also, if you're interested in little slices of life in Japan, be sure to check out my website over at heatheroveryonder.com. Thank you for tuning in today. We hope you enjoyed the episode. And if you have any suggestions for future episodes, 
or have anything you'd love to hear about, head on over to historyofjapan.co.uk and send us a message. If you enjoyed the show, please be sure to give us a rating and review over on iTunes. Right now, it's the best place to do so, and it helps us get the word out about this show. Thanks again for listening, guys. Until next time, bye. Mata ne.